Welcome to episode 12 of Run to the Hills. Uh, we love being back and it's great to be back each week to chat to you and to share some of our thoughts about ultra running. And this episode is going to be all about the Hardmores 55, which took place last Saturday. But before we get on to any of that, welcome Eddie. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's happening in France, because we hear lots of stories about lockdown and all that's going on. Oh, John, I've had a bad week, a bad, bad week. It's been a few tears this week, not from me. Um, um, from the kids. <laughs> yeah, we've been put back into today is our first day of lockdown in France. Um, understandably, the, um, the uh, virus was rising rapidly and um, they had to do something about it. And I do like the way in France, they're like clear cut. This is what's happening. It's happening to everybody. This is what you have to do. Done. There's no discussion. The police will enforce the rules. But it's been a bit tough this week. The kids had um, been really looking forward to all their things that they were going to do this week and everything was cancelled. And so breaking it to a five-year-old, the swimming lessons have been cancelled and everything. They don't really understand it. And then we've then it's rained all week and we haven't had a, a ton of stuff to do. They're not allowed to see their friends. So it's been a bit, um, it's just been a bit low, but we've tried to raise morale. And um, so now we are back in confinement. And for those that don't know, this means as a runner... Um, you are allowed out for an hour a day um, and you have to stay within a kilometer of your home. Uh, you're not allowed to go as a crow flies. It has to be a path. So you can't sort of like go up the mountain um, and you have a form you have to fill out with the time you left your house and your address on and a piece of ID and off you go. And they police it. They drive up and down. Even though I live at the end of a no, no through road in the mountains, they drive up maybe like three times a day and they have been seen on the tracks in the, I call them golf buggies, which makes my husband's laugh because he's like, they're not golf buggies, whatever they are, off-road things. They come up off the tracks and check that you've got the, oh my God, the, I, I, so I, I stick to the rules um, and I run, keep to a kilometer and I keep to the hour, but the, I find it really stressful, even though, you know, with the form and then the form gets all sweaty and then they pee and sometimes they don't stop. Most, I think last time, um, so we were on this lockdown last time from March to the middle of May and I only, I got stopped three times, I think, and I'm going out every day, but I still... I don't enjoy it. You can't relax when you're running because you sort of, you're always, I don't know why. I just feel like, I just feel on edge. And of course you're running the same bit of path endlessly. So this morning I went out and I did my first hour on the same path. And I decided a few things that um, I was going to try and use it as a, um, a bit of a training focus because um, we talked last week that I wasn't going to get to the South Downs Way 100. So I was going to have an easier week this week, which is what I've done. And I feel great. I feel so much better than I did this time last week when I felt quite tired. And we talked about maybe like doing a big challenge or, thing, or something, but I'm not going to do that because I've only got this hour outside. Um, so instead, I thought more sensibly, I'm going to prepare myself for winter because uh, our confinement is going to finish at the beginning of December and then it's going to be a week until we can put our skis on hopefully. Um, so I'm going to instead do a little training block to get my body ready for alpine sports. So um, I'm going to jump back on the turbo back on my bike for those listeners that have been following us from the beginning. Hi mum dad. Bryn. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was a triathlete before I was an ultra runner, so I have got some bike skills still in my uh, quads. I sat on my turbo um, the, uh, a couple of days ago just to see how I felt, and I felt great. I was like, I don't, I think I could, uh, I can still push some watts. So I set my bike back up, and I'm gonna run for my hour a day. I'm gonna do uh, my session on the bike. So I'm going to use my run in, as a bit of like downtime and just some mental de-stressing because it's going to be my only break I get outside. And then I'm going to do some big sessions on the bike, carry on with my, you know, my beloved Pilates and get some strength in there and use this as like a positive training block. Maybe it will curtail my, my mountain um, adventures a little bit, but maybe that's a good thing. I've just done a huge block and then I'm going to go into winter and be skiing you know, I just, I love skiing. I have to be pulled off the mountain. So I can sometimes ski like 20 hours a week. So I think I'm trying to look at this positively and think like the next five weeks, I can actually do some quality sessions, a little bit less, a little bit more rest, 
work on my French, work on my podcast uh, skills, not talking so much. And so that's how I'm going to cope with it. And keeping my kids fit and healthy because all their sports have stopped. They're still allowed to go to school. Thank you, baby Jesus. Otherwise, that would have been horrendous. They're still allowed to go to school, but they don't have their sports. And for kids that do 10 hours plus of sports a week outside their normal school, it's, it's a huge loss and there's nothing else. That's their life. So we've made a little chart, my middle son, and um, we've worked out how many kilometers it is to granny and grandpa's and we're all going to try and jointly run it to Wales um, and he's already done 2k already this morning and he's filled out his chart so that's how the Sutton family are going to cope with confinement in France and keep morale up and I'm going to come out with thighs like an alpine skier hopefully <laughs> how are you John how are you feeling yeah, well, at, at this episode is going to be a little bit more about me in a sense of the uh, the hard more. So we'll we'll come on to that in a, in a few minutes. He's keeping um, he's keeping his powder dry because he right. knows he's going to get a little telling off from Eddie in a minute. Oh yes, I oh, know. <laughs> I'm dreading. I, I saw your message, so I'm I'm waiting. I'm waiting <laughs> with anticipation. But we thought we'd just move on to the what the race reports. So this week, there was three races that we followed. Uh, the first one was the 100-mile track race organized by Mark Coburn uh, at St. Ives. And um, the winner was Michael Bisson in 15 hours, 19.04. And the lady winner was Sarah Marshall in 20 hours, 06.32. 46 people started this race and 21 finished. <laughs> uh, wow. Which isn't many, but I saw some of the photos and it looked horrendous. The rain and the wind. Uh, and it was really, really cold. Uh, a friend, Sharon Gator, was running, and uh, she she stopped after about uh, 80 kilometers because she just couldn't get warm. It was just so bad. So even though it was a track race, I think the hard stuff uh, was certainly came into play. Shout out to Mike as well, because he put on our Facebook group that he was doing this race, mm. and he was hoping to break um, his PB, and he was hoping to go sub-24. <laughs> And he did 15 hours, 15 hours and 19 minutes. So I said, I'm going to chat to him to find out that huge improvement, what he'd done. And he was obviously very chuffed with that. Uh, we had the South Downs Way 50, um, which was won by Josh Barrow in 6 hours 15 and Michelle Maxwell in 8 hours 15. And there were 278 finished, which is still a really good number. I think the record to finish that event is about 315. So that's a really good number to have at the moment. And I interviewed them both yesterday and that will be coming out next week. Really great interview with both of them about their approach to the race, how the race went, because it was close in both the female and the male categories, but it's a time trial format like the Hardmore Switch 5. So neither of them knew where they were. Even when they finished, they had to stand and wait um, until the others finished. So it's a really great interview. Look forward to um, putting that out next week. Yep. And the third race that we followed was the Hardmore's 55, which we'll talk more about. And uh, the men's winner was Ben Hamilton in 8 hours 17. And the female winner was Claire Howard in, 12 hour, in sorry, 10 hours 12. And 229 of us finished in 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 that one. Um, and I interviewed Ben and Kendra, which will come out in which will come on in a, a few minutes' time. So let's move on to our top tip. Now this week it was my turn to share something about uh, a top tip, and I decided I wanted to share something about staying positive. Um, on Saturday, I say I ran the Hardmore's 55, and I. I joined a guy called Alex at one point and Alex, uh, hopefully you're listening, Alex. I was encouraging, encouraging him to follow, our, <laughs> follow us on Run we'll to the checking. Hills. Yeah. And um, it was his first ultra and we met with about 25 miles to go, maybe a bit more, 30 miles to go just before I was motherly. And we ran together for a while and I was sharing one of my top tips with him. I said, it'll be out on this episode. And what, it, what I wanted to share was this idea of trying to stay positive. I think, Running the distances we run, the times we run, 10 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours, it's hard to stay positive for that whole time. And there's so many things that can come into your mind that drags you down mentally. You know, you get cold, you get hungry, you, 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 you get behind on your splits, something hurts, um, a number of things that can start to 
put you into that negative uh, mindset. And the problem with it is that when you think in negatively, it affects you physically. And it's a, like a downward spiral. And very quickly, if you're not careful, you can get to that state where you think, oh, I've got to stop um, because all these things are going wrong. Um, a few months ago, I interviewed a guy called and uh, Andy Du Bois, who's a, a, a based on Australia. He's a, a running coach for the West Highland Way podcast that I do, and um, he shared with me something which really resonated with me. And it was the idea: if if you're in a negative state and a, you're thinking negatively with all these thoughts about, you know, ultimately stopping the race. And um, he said it's quite difficult to move from that to a positive state where you're. At top on top of things and happy and moving forward so he said one of the things that you need to do is to try and move into a neutral state first and then um, so he had different techniques for doing that and that's something which i think i did before but it just helped me to really sort of crystallize it in my thinking and for me the way i try and get into a neutral state and get out of a negative state is counting. <laughs> I do loads of counting. So I'll count, <laughs> a count up to 100. Each time a right foot hits the ground, I'll count a so one, two, three. And I just try and keep that going. When I get to 100, I'll swap foot and I'll count my left foot. And sometimes I combine it with maybe running for 100 and walking for 20. Um, but just trying to just get my mind out of that neutral um, negative state into a neutral state. Sometimes I'll do things like I'll count one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, and just keep on going. Sometimes I'll do it backwards. Oh, I've got, I've got loads of different things that I do. But basically what I'm trying to achieve is to get out of that negative thought in my mind and try and get into a neutral place. And then hopefully once I've done that, it might only take 10 minutes. Sometimes it takes a lot longer and to get into a more positive frame of mind. And I found even on Saturday, and we'll come on to that, was there was a time where I, I, I did struggle on Saturday and I was quite a low point. And I used this technique and it helped me to get through it. And then after a while, you feel a bit more positive again. And then you're starting to think about the end and keep going. So that would be my top tip this week, Eddie, is to think about how to stay positive and how to get back into a positive state if you're in a negative state. And then um, it's quite interesting because I think people have different techniques of doing that. I say counting, I'm fairly simple, I think, and counting is the easiest thing for me. Um, but I know other people, like for example, my wife, when she's doing these long races as well, uh, she likes to plan her wardrobe. And so she'll think about the next week and what she's going to wear each day and what combination she's going to wear of things. Other people, I read once in a running magazine, the guy who's an architect will spend the run planning out a house. And if he's got time, he'll, he'll add on an extension to it. So I think different <laughs> people use different techniques to try and sort of get into that, um, into that neutral state and into that uh, positive frame of mind. Um, so that would be my top tip to try and you find something that works for you to help you to get from that negative into a neutral and then to be able to think positive. So Eddie, what are your, have you, is that something that you would uh, identify with? Well, it's, it was exactly what I was thinking this morning as I did my first confinement run and I was going up and down the same bit of track for 500 meters and there's no point thinking negatively because it's going to affect your performance and it's going to affect um, your mindset. And I often try and just go, I call it facial collapse and I just try and totally zone out and I, I practice this on running and when I'm running and, and I, I think it's one of my first points to be a, is uh, to, to build this mental toughness is you have to practice it in training. You have to do things to um, elicit this, this feeling to then how you're going to cope with it. And everybody copes with it differently, just like how we cope with confinement is that some people will be able to turn it into a positive, like I'm trying to very hardly portray, <laughs> try to portray on this podcast that I'm going to be very positive. But you know, uh, that's the way I cope with something like that. I try, I try and think of a way to handle it and I'm going to turn this into positive. But that might not work. For, if that's not definite, maybe the right way. As someone else, it might be that they have to cope with it in a different way. So it's very individual, like you said, and it is something that you have to practice in training and work out what works for you. And I think it's taken me probably like you, John, years to be able to go, to me, I go to this neutral place where there's nothing. There's not a lot... <laughs> It might just be my everyday blonde place, but there's not, there's nothing going on in my head 
Uh, people talk about the flow, don't they? And I'm just trying to get to that point where I'm just running and there's no voices. And I'm just sort of totally absorbed in what I'm doing and what I task. And it's very hard to do, especially in um, this day and age when there's a whole, there's const, we're constantly on this slight adrenaline hit. So um, it's, it's going out, you know, no, sorry, podcast listeners, but no podcast, no music, going out and truly being with yourself and listening to yourself and learning how you cope with being with yourself is so important. Um, a, a couple of quick, really quick things, other things to, to sort of build that positivity in your running is to have a reason to why you're doing something, a training session, why you're doing it in the block, the race, why you're doing why you're doing this race um think about other things other than yourself because we as ultra runners are intrinsically quite selfish you know it's all about us and our race um but you know think about put it on to other people with my kids i often think about my kids and how i i want them to see me and how i'm doing this for them and how i want to go home and they're going to say how'd it go mom you know so I, you know you take it outside of yourself and you and you you almost give it to somebody else so it becomes sort of this less this inner um, demon talking to you and um, a mantra this is what we're going to talk about finally uh, have just have something you can repeat like your numbers something that you compete that means a lot to you I I gave this to a client uh, on the South Downs way actually and he was he'd had a bit of a crappy race a couple of weeks before and he was really disappointed I was really disappointed because I felt that he could have done a lot better but you can't say it never tell a client disappointed in them um uh and so i we we did a little training block and we got focused and i said right all i want you to think about for this race is to be brave so to keep it really simple i would start with yeah have a mantra make sure you have a purpose to race and have a mantra for that race and something that you can just repeat um damien hall for his pennine way he wrote f f f on his um hand in permanent marker and he said that was family, friends, and future. He said sometimes it was swear words as well. But having that just, it summarizes everything, I think. That's great for the mantra. And that's what we're going to do for our competition this week. Yeah, so for our competition, and um, the best one that will, will receive a, a cheer charge bandana. So that's the prize for, for this week. And yeah, we'll, what we're looking for is w what technique do you use to, keep, to get you into that positive frame of mind? If it's a mantra that you love, then share that with us. If it's something like I've done there with accounting, share your thoughts of how you can move from that negative to a neutral to a positive. We're looking for your stories. I'll put a post on Facebook and you have till next Thursday to enter. So yeah, look forward to reading all your wonderful mantras. No swearing. So now we need to get into the real nitty gritty of the podcast. You're, the moment you've all been waiting for is to find out how John's race went, the Hardmores 55. Um, I've got a couple of questions planned for John. He's squirming in his seat a little bit, <laughs> listeners, because um, if you've read his blog or his video content, um, you'll know that his race maybe um, didn't go entirely to plan. There were some hurdles to overcome and perhaps he didn't overcome those hurdles the best that he could, but he's lived and he's learned and he's been quite, um, he's been quite, uh, he's realized this very soon that he made some errors. But first, John, congratulations, you finished. Tell us just a little bit about the race and then we'll go into some of the minor, just a little few of the minor details of the day out. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this was the seventh time I've done this race and uh, I just love it. I love John and Shirley, they're good friends. I did the very first one in 2020. And I say this is the seventh time I've, I've done it. So I love the route. It alternates. Sometimes it goes from Helmsley to Giesborough. Uh, that's, the, that's the route, I, that's the direction I prefer, if I'm honest. Uh, but this year it was Giesborough to, to Helmsley. And uh, I set off with my good friends, Andy and Sarah Norman. We'd organized, we gave the same time. We estimated we were going to finish around about 13 hours. So we started together and I ran with them for most of the race, which was great. It was lovely having a chat with Sarah, having a chat with Andy, having a chat with both of them. And the miles sort of passed pretty well. And I would say I felt pretty happy up until it, it's about 30 miles. And um, I'd sort of, um, it, it was, 
the, the first 20 was right into the wind, which was hard work because even the flat bits and the down bits, you were having to work so much harder because it was a strong headwind. Um, and then it started really raining for about 45 minutes, just round about for us, round about Lord's Cafe. And again, I was with Andy and Sarah. We all put our coats on just in time. So that helped, but we were drenched. Um, and then I went ahead of them a bit uh, into our motherly. And then I stopped to get a few things sorted out and they went past me. I caught them up again. And uh, that's when things probably went, didn't go quite so well. So I don't know whether you want to take it from there. So the weather sounds like it was a mixed bag of, um, not sure I've heard of any sun yet, but wind and rain and, um, and cold. And you were out for quite a long time. And I think... Um, one thing I sort of pulled from your report and from our sort of WhatsApp chat is that you got very cold um, and that sort of hampered that second half of the race. And perhaps you could have um, stopped and got a little warmer. What was the th your sort of thought process that you carried on until you were really cold and then thought, right, but sort of, what were you thinking? What were you thinking, John? <laughs> the thing is, I, I, recently um, I, I spoke to a friend, Stephen Brown, who were doing the countdown to the spine with. And by the way, the next one's out on uh, this weekend. And one of the things that Stephen said to me, which I've really taken on board but didn't, <laughs> was, was to, uh, as, if you think about doing something, do it. Yes. Ra rather yes. than wasting time. So yes. I'd, uh, I'd put my coat on at the right time. And uh, so that was good. Um, but I'd, I'd stopped at Osmotherly to sort out, because I needed to get my head torch out. I needed to um, change the battery on my, on my GoPro camera. Uh, that's important. Essentials <laughs> and, here, yeah. and, team. Uh, and, and get my battery out to, to recharge my Sunto uh, watch. It, I knew I, I needed to do that. <laughs> um, so I'd, I'd done those things. And Andy and Sarah had gone past me. And then, um, so I spent the next hour catching them up. And they stopped out just outside of Osmotherly Square Corner. And they were putting warm clothes on. So as I caught them, I was thinking, oh, that's a good idea. You know, it is, it's getting dark now. It's going to yeah. be dark in the yeah. next half an hour. The temperature's going down. But because I'd just caught them, I'd, I, made, I, I decided, oh, let, you know, I knew if I'd stopped, they would get ahead again. And I'd have to mm. work another hour to catch them up. Mm, mm. So I think, I think having their company was mm, more important mm, than doing mm. what I should have done. Do you think at that point you were slightly under fueled? Because I often think yeah. you make poor decisions when your brain is not being supported by calories. And so you kind of like, it just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is survival. I'm going to stay with these people rather than actually I need to stop and get warm and eat. Personal admin, John, your GoPro battery and your Sunto watch took um, president over. Anyway, <laughs> do, you, do you think you were slightly under fueled then? I think so, because I'd, I'd, I'd been eating really well. And because I'd been running a bit, bit more comfortably, I, I, I felt well within myself. Yeah. So I was drinking well, I was eating well. I, I felt, yeah. But the last hour before Osmotherly, it, you know, because it was so cold and wet, and, and it, I find it harder to eat when it's really wet. Yeah, Because your yeah. gloves are yeah. on. You've got yeah. your big, I swap my gloves. Um, so it takes more effort to get your food out. So I find yeah. it easier not to do it, um, which is not great. Um, but I think I think the thing what, what, when I first caught them, I wasn't that cold, in a sense. But I, I remember thinking, "Oh, that's a good idea," you know. And as and your Andy, mate Steve says, the yeah, moment I, you think about it, right. you need to do it. Yeah. And Shall I'm, I put my gloves on? Shall I get my head torch out? Shall I put my coat on? It's it's not a question there. It's just like if you start to feel thirsty, isn't it? The moment you feel thirsty, it's your brain saying, yeah. "I'm dehydrated. I need to drink." So. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember because I, I went on with Sarah and Andy wasn't with us for a bit. And then eventually he caught us up and he said, oh, I got really cold there. So I just I just stopped to put an extra layer on his, his merino uh, layer. And I, I remember thinking, oh, that's a good idea, Andy. <laughs> but, but again, I, I, I found because um, normally I, I don't get cold, if I'm honest. Yeah, uh, I, I run in shorts all year round. I, I'm quite comfortable with that. Um, and I had two layers on, I had a base layer, I had my green top, which I always wear, and I had a, a good thick coat on, a, you know, a good waterproof coat. So I thought that would be enough. And it normally is when I'm moving fairly well. Yeah, well, that was what I was going to say. It's because you were, you were moving quite a bit slower than 
you normally were. So let's talk a little bit about the running, the actual mm. running, rather than me just telling you off. <laughs> how, how did you feel in the running compared to like maybe the other years? And do you think that was a reason why you got colder because you were moving a little bit slower? And the terrain dictated that as well, didn't it? Because it sounded like it was quite muddy and windy. So um, yeah. I think there's yeah. a couple of factors there. One is I- I'm getting older. <laughs> And Stop I, I just, it. I've just got to, I'm having to come to terms with it, if I'm honest, Eddie. Yeah. Because, you know, I've, I've done this race. My best time was nine hours 36, which is basically under 10 and a half minute mile pace, you know, for the whole race. And I could, I could, I could do that five, that was five years ago. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I know just in my training runs, you know, I go up on the braids. I used to be able to do that, the route that I do comfortably in about 145. Now it's taken me two and a half hours to do that same, mm. that same mm. route on a training run. Mm. Um, and I, I am struggling, if I'm honest, just having to come to terms with not being able to run as fast as I used to be able to. In my head, I still feel the same. I feel as though I'm running, you know, the same effort, the same uh, you know, sort of um, perceived effort, but it's just slower. And so that that's one factor I think I've just I'm having to come to terms with that. But does a bit that in my does head. that matter? Like does does it because does it matter to you that you're do do you does that affect your sort of enjoyment of it that you're slower or can you go with the fact that you it's the same you feel it's the same effort you're still the same wonderful John. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm I'm getting there. Yeah, um, but it it's not. It's not as easy as that. As, as no, just, as that. Yeah, I, no, no. And I'm still, I'm still. I, I would say I really enjoyed Saturday, even though mm. I, you know, I had a battle and I got through. I still enjoyed it. I love being out there. I love meeting people. I love the whole atmosphere. So I'm, my enjoyment is still as high. Yeah. But it's just, um, it's just recognizing that I can't go as fast as I as I used to. Um, and then I, th- I think the other factor that was in there was that I was very much aware that I've got another race coming up two weeks later. Of course, yeah. Um, and so that was very much in my thoughts that I wanted to make sure, which as I think I said before, I, I don't like to do this normally. I don't like to have two races so close together because I love to give 100% to every race I do. So it was in the back of my mind and certainly for the first 30 miles, I was, I was trying to run well within myself. And I, I, my heart rate was great. I, I didn't, I didn't use a monitor, but I knew, you know, I, had, I, I didn't, I didn't breathe hard at all. Yeah. You know, I just sort of kept it under control. Well, I think that, I think that you probably, maybe you've never, you've never done that before. And I think that's a huge mental block that your brain puts up. You knew, and a hun- it's not another 50, it's a hundred, you know, you knew that was coming. And so that, I think you're you almost like went into a bit of self-preservation mode as well um and that you know I'm going to take I'm going to take this really seriously and it didn't allow you to perhaps do what you could you could you could do on that course because you knew I've got you know I've got to be finished this I've got to be recovered I've got to be ready to go again and that that almost doesn't allow you it doesn't allow your brain to then go well run free run to feel I'm feeling great you were always on the hold back which I think makes doing a race and that's what I'd never do that either and I don't encourage people to do it I know some people can is that they can spread their eggs out over many baskets but um for us maybe that's a little bit trickier the mental side of being able to really throw yourself into it and I also think maybe um because you had this other big race next do you think you hadn't perhaps mentally prepared that you still were going to run 55 miles and you thought well because there's only half the distance I'm doing in a few weeks I've done it loads of times. It's quite easy. Had you sort of perhaps not thought, I'm still going to have to get myself maybe out of a few holes. And it was a bit of a surprise when you did. I think so. And I think as well, I was looking back, this is the furthest I've ran for a long time, actually. Mm. Um, because last year I, um, I did the Dragon's Back, but that was, that was 190 miles, but it was over five days. And then I did the... Uh, I did, uh, I did the Devil of the Highlands, which is 40 odd, and I did the Oak Hill, which was 50. So I've not done that distance actually mm. for a two, for a two or three years, at least two years. So that that again, it, it, I, I was quite surprised when I thought about that, you know, yeah. because as you said, suddenly being on my feet for 14 hours, and um, that was quite new. That was the longest I'd been on my feet for a, for a good for a good while. Um, yeah, so I and, think even, that, and even though in. we're seasoned ultra runners, it still comes a bit of a shock, mm. doesn't it? That fatigue mm. that you feel you're like, oh no, 
Oh, it's like having a baby when you, you oh no, I don't want to do this again. Oh no, I don't like this. The old friend fatigue creeps in and you're like, you question yourself, even though, you know, we've done it quite a few times. Um, normally on a normal year and, you know, we'd have done it a couple of, we'd have been there and it, it revisited the old pain cave, but there hasn't been that opportunity. So it was, I think what you did was, was brilliant. And I love the fact that you've still got learnings when you're as old as you are. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah. And I you'll never won't put your coat on again when you see the dark cloud coming. That's right. I think as well, I, um, I, I, I was very, very, very aware that I wanted to finish well, which obviously I'd, <laughs> I'd sort yes, of put, tell us I, about that. Cause you said you'd had quite a few people going past. Yeah. Going. Yeah, it was lovely, actually, because there was quite a few people thanking us for the podcast and saying they're enjoying Run to the Hills. Big so fans, that, yeah, big so, fans. So thank you very much for those that are listening who, who said that. Um, but I, yeah, I was, I was conscious of trying to live by what I'd said. Um, and I would like to think I did finish well. Um, just not quite as fast. <laughs> Maybe not um, as fast, but I think mentally you'd yeah, come mentally, out. Of, you know, yeah. you mentally you'd pulled yourself back up, and you'd yeah. and you were sort of like, yeah, I'm back. I love this. Yeah. I'm doing this. Yeah. I think once I once I'd put that extra layer on, and then um, the next half an hour was still quite cold. I, I was getting really cold on my arms, uh, in, inside the jacket. Without even when I put the extra layer on, I was still feeling quite shivery. Um, and then it took me a good half an hour or so. And then th thankfully you dropped down a bit to High Paradise Farm. Mm. So it wasn't, mm. you had, we're at the wind then. And then I would say from the last checkpoint onwards, so the last 15 miles, I felt comfortable. Mm. I wasn't cold mm. at all. And mm. I, I was on top of things and I was, I was eating a bit more and I was drinking my tailwind. So I felt as though I, I got through it. But it was just that I would say an hour and a half which I'd, I made it difficult for myself. Mm, mm. I think if I'd, when I'd, when I, I think what I should have done is put on my layer, when I stopped at Osmotherly to sort out my essentials, <clears> um, <throat> if, I'd have, if I'd have put on a layer then, I think that would have made all the difference because and I, I think been... as well as when you get cold and it's windy, you need those extra calories. You almost mm. need to shove in an extra bar and yeah. just like when you stop, I'm just going to eat this extra 300 calories because I'm shivering. Yeah. I'm cold. All your blood had obviously gone into your mm. internal organs. So that's why your arms were getting sick because there's nothing, you know, you're not moving properly. And yeah. I think, in, yeah, the weather um, and running on difficult terrain, you sort of forget how many more, calories you need to keep you're not only running you're keep trying to keep yourself warm and then if you don't feed your brain it can't make the, the, the decisions and as you said you hadn't run that long way for a long time so the fueling your body was like well what am I doing here you know I've missed a few meal I'm not used to this um so it was sort of remembering yeah I can use my fat I can I, I need to keep fueling. I need to keep using what's in my stomach. So, well, we as listeners are super proud of you, John. Uh, and we love sharing your journey. We love tracking you. And I've read your blog. It's great. I think, have you put it on our Facebook um, page? Yep. You must have. Yep. I'll, and, put, I'll um, put it on the show notes as well. Yeah. Put it on the show notes. And I haven't watched your video yet because I felt that was a bit too much of you this week. So <laughs> I'll save that till I'm missing a bit and I'll watch it. <laughs> yeah. I would say though, just that I think my takeaways from this, this race was, yeah. would definitely be to, um, you know, to, to sort myself out quicker and look after myself better. I think I, I made a mistake. You know, I, I should have put those clothes on. But I think the, I think the other thing I'll take away from this is that I'm, I'm not going to do this again. Doing, okay. try, try and plan okay. two races yeah. too close together. Oh, yeah. Because I, I just don't, I don't enjoy having that attitude that I had for yeah. Saturday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I love the race. And I, I, I almost felt as though I, not disrespected You were cheating it. on your girlfriend a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's all right. yeah it was that sense of um you know I, i'm not giving this 100 yeah. percent, and i don't like that I'm the, i think yeah. the sort of character i am i love to give 100 percent whatever i do oh really <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just felt i wasn't doing that yeah um, and i don't I, did, I don't like that feeling um so I, I i won't do this again and if you ever see but you'll the do entrance... the race again you'll do the oh, race yeah again. yeah definitely not, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, um, yeah but not I won't, with a, with yeah few weeks I, I wouldn't so. plan two races i normally love at least six weeks if not eight weeks between races oh, I find, yeah i, find that's I my like ideal. a whole yeah a whole other train i like to break it yeah. close the cycle whole yeah. other rest recovery another training yeah. block and i think that goes back to our mental yeah. strength doesn't it is that yeah. you need to have the cycle to in, in order yeah. to commit to the race and that yeah. was hard for you because you were sort of one leg in one leg out weren't yeah. you there was there was one year 2010 i decided to do four races in uh, in four months so I, I did the the hardmost 55 the fling a month later the catarin a month later and the west harlem way 
and I just had four weeks between each. I was a bit of an experiment to see if it worked, but I, I, it didn't work for me because I, I just I, I got to the West Highland Way, which was my just main exhausted. race. Exhausted. Yeah, and I was so tired to start with because I'd done three 50 mile races in the three months leading up to it, and it just didn't work. And I said then I wouldn't do this again. <laughs> so we uh, never learn. I we know. never learn. I know. Yeah. But anyway, so thanks for listening to that. And that was uh, my story of how the, the Hardmost 55 went. So we, we thought now we're going to sh- share an, an interview which I did this week. And then um, we've, we've got it's with the, the male winner, Ben Hamilton. And um, we didn't interview them, the female winner this time. It was Claire Howard, who we had on a few weeks ago when she won the, the one the 110 um, but we thought we'd have a little contrast so we've got Ben Hamilton who won the race and we've got Kendra Wedgwood who finished just over 12 hours so this is my interview that I did this week with Ben and Kendra hey. for this part of our podcast there uh, for this episode where look where I've got two runners in fact, three runners, because I ran it as well. And I'm in my <laughs> T-shirt from the Hardmores 55. So I've got Ben and Kendra. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. And I'm looking forward to finding out a little bit more about how your races went. But maybe just to start with, you could just introduce yourself and maybe tell us how you feel a few days after the race. Uh, well, I'm Kendra Wedgwood, and uh, this is my first year running the Hardmores series. And I'm running the Super Slam this year. And um, I feel really great. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, I feel great. I couldn't feel any better. Well, that's, uh, that's encouraging to hear. And Ben, how, how are you feeling? I started I start to feel better today, recovering nicely now. But Sunday, Monday, we're yeah, just tired out, worn out. But it's to be expected a few aching muscles and what have you. But getting there. So I think I'll be out for a run tomorrow. Well done. Excellent. Now, I've got, I've got some questions for each of you, but uh, feel free to add in as well if there's other things that you wanted to say. So, Ben, I just, I've not met you before, but uh, I was looking at your D, DUV stats, and um, am I right in thinking this was your longest ultra? It is, yeah, uh, indeed. So, I've, I've, yeah, I ran the Lakeland 50 a couple of times, but, yeah, this is a couple of miles further, or three, three and a bit miles further than that. Yeah. Um, so, yes, it is. So tell us a little bit about your plan going into this race. I mean, like same same for all of us. You know, Kendra will have had this in yourself, John. Is you know, this year has been a funny old year, mm. so lots of races cancelled. So my whole plan for the year had gone to pot essentially. So Hardmore's Fifty Five is my sole focus. So I just had a really really good block of training built, being able to be you know competitive at the front end and put in a decent time as well. Yeah. So I'm assuming that you come from a quite a, a speedy background, do you? Marathons and other things you've done? Yeah, I suppose. I, I didn't get back into running probably until my early 30s, I think, and then focused on road running, a bit of speed and stuff there, but then soon transitioned to doing the off-road trail stuff. Like, well, it's much more fun, isn't it, getting muddy and wet and running <laughs> up and down hills. I think, you know, again, you, you guys will think the same thing, I'm sure. Yeah. Great. Well, it's uh, it's great to have you with us, and uh, I think I think once you once you're into the ultras, you, you don't you don't look back. No, no definitely no. not. Yeah. And then Kendra. Now I know recently you did the the Hardmore's one ten, and also the Hardmore's sixty. Um, so how was your recovery wise between those two races and this one? And how did you uh, did you feel ready physically for this race on Saturday? Um, I did. Yes, um, I felt great at the start of uh, the fifty five. Um, I think the back-to-back long events have worked really well for me um, mm. because one has been training for the next. Um, I felt really great at the end of the 110. Um, the 60 took me about a week to get over that, but I think that was because of the sun. Um, but um, I went into the 55 feeling really, really good, really rested, and, yeah, just was really excited to do it. So, um, yeah, this structure has actually worked really well for me. Yeah. And was that always the plan to do the Grand Slam or the, the Super Slam? Yes. Um, I call it my midlife crisis. I've turned 40 <laughs> this year. Um, and so completing the Super Slam was really important for me. And then when COVID hit and uh, races started getting cancelled, um, I was really uh, I was, I was really upset that I was going to miss out. But then obviously they put the races back on. So it's just been a really, really good year for me, and I feel really privileged to have been able to do all these races. So, yeah, I've just had a really, really good year. Yeah. 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 Well done. 
So Ben, it's always funny, quite interesting to hear how things are at the sharp end of the race. You know, uh, you, said, <laughs> you said just in your introduction there that you wanted to see how you could be competitive and, and to sort of um, to put yourself out there. Uh, so tell us a little bit about, your, about the race and how it went. Were you running with people? Were you on your own? And how did it work out? Yeah, you know, same, same for all of us. Again, um, you know, a bit of a strange start, the little groups of uh, four or five people. So, so yeah, I don't know any of the guys who we set off with. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm, no matter what I do, I think it's always, it's, a, a, it's a, a marathon, not a sprint. It's an ultra marathon, not a sprint, I suppose. So, um, so it's always steady away. There's a long, long way to go, a lot of time or what have you. But um, yeah, just for the, for the first sort of six, seven miles staying with the, you know, the, the two or three other guys who were up there. And then just at, at Kildale, the climb out of Kildale up to, up to Bloweth and away. I was by myself and never saw a soul mm. you know, after, after that. Um, it's always a psychological thing, though, in, you know, in your mind, in those sort of races, you have no idea where people are and, and who you're up against as well. So it's just a case of keep my head down and, and, and keep going. And you know, I say again, I have to thank Mundy, my partner, for, for being out there crewing me and keeping me, keeping me going and keeping me on my, my race plan. Yeah. Now, I assume you were in the first group, were you, setting off? Yeah, so we started at eight o'clock. So yeah, there was uh, four of us doing the 55 and then a, a relay runner as well, yes. Right, okay. So I assume you don't quite know, do you? There might be someone who started 10 minutes behind you who was actually running faster. So you don't quite know, do you? No, I did straight. Some, uh, a guy who I work with today was asking me about that, actually. So he, mm. he was on about that. So yeah, absolutely have, have no idea, you know, because people's predictions of times and when they want to set off is is um is very different so yeah exactly until i mean ultimately you wouldn't have known until potentially hours after the race had finished so there's there could have been somebody way back there started way later who's who's ahead of you yeah 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 it's a strange strange experience yeah Yeah, i'm I'm not sure it'll be hours but maybe (laughs) (laughs) yeah a few few minutes maybe (laughs) yeah 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 Um, because you you finished at a time of um, eight hours 17 minutes and five seconds so was that was that what you were aiming for around that sort of time did you have a time in your mind yeah so i mean i i I thought somewhere between eight and eight thirty i would have loved to have done sub eight um i think unfortunately weather conditions and wind and what have you it's there's certainly some time was to be made there and it was it was tough tough going so I'm more than happy and more than chuffed with that sort of time over a, a tough course, you know. Yeah. I think and anybody completing that course is, you know, a winner. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, no, thank I, you. Yeah. Uh, this was my, the seventh time I've run this race. And then um, <laughs> I did the very first one and it was probably similar conditions to, the, to this one. And then we've had some, I've had some great weather actually. But we've had some rough ones as well. Uh, but yeah. uh, I think we certainly had a good mixture of weather on Saturday, didn't we? Um, Definitely. So, so Kendra, how, how did you find the wind and the rain, and particularly the mud? Um, was that something that you uh, had to battle with? Uh, no, I love it. Love, love, <laughs> love it. The better for me, definitely. I take the wind, the rain, the mud every day over the sun. I I loved every minute of that fifty-five. That was wow. that was perfect. I absolutely loved it yeah 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 so have you got a, a, a technique then for getting through the mud because i must admit i am um, i found that bit when we left uh, white horse that last nine miles there's some stretches there where you know it's it's slightly downhill and i know i probably should be running but i just find it hard work but are, are you comfortable on the mud then what's your secret oh I, that was my favorite part um, i just <laughs> Yeah, um, I think it's totally different to Ben because I'm the back of the pack runner, so I don't have the pressure of having to run fast, or I just need to get you know get to the end and just enjoy it. So it's a totally probably a different experience. So I just absolutely loved that last section that you're talking about there, and I remember that really fondly. And I was running with Adam Adam Nodwell uh, for a bit with that um, on that section, and we were just having a laugh, and it was just brilliant. Absolutely loved it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think, Kendra, I, th- I don't think you can class yourself as a back of the field because uh, I, I was further back. I, I, um, but your time was 12 hours, 11.42. So again, was that a time that you were happy with, you were aiming for, or, or didn't you have a goal? Um, I was aiming for about 13 hours, and I knew you must have been aiming for about the same. So when I overtook you at like two and a half miles in, I was thinking, oh, no, I've ruined it. <laughs> 
But then I thought, right, just remember to finish well, finish well. And I thought maybe I've underestimated my time. And I think I had. I think I probably was near to the 12 hour, had it been a bit better weather. But um, I just took it steady all day, kept my heart rate low. And I just didn't, I didn't race at all. I just enjoyed it. And I think I finished quicker than I would have done if I'd have raced it, if that makes sense. Mm, yeah. Um, do you know what I mean? So mm. yeah, I just had a really good day. I kept I kept you in my head saying <laughs> finish well, finish well, and I'm going to take that going forward because that clearly is what worked for me. So yeah. thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. And the, the thing that Ken just mentioned there, Ben, was that um, in a previous episode, we do top tips each week. And Edwina, my co-host and I, we sort of share different top tips. And mine a couple of weeks ago was about how that I try and finish well now. So to finish well, I need to start sensibly and then yeah. try and finish well. And then Kendra put a post on our Facebook page saying that that, that was going to be her mantra for the race to try and make sure she finished well. So it's nice to hear yeah. that you did. And you obviously had a, a really strong finish there. So that was good. I'm always fascinated, Ben, just to sort of see what it's like at the top end as well for, you know, obviously we, we all know what it's like to sort of run these distances, those of us who do it. Um, and we all go through, or most of us go through at times of low points. Um, so would you say, you know, this being your longest race that you've done so far, were there any points where you, it was low and you felt as though you had to battle through? I think, yeah, for, for me, whilst it's, you know, the, the love of running like it, or that sort of distance, it is very, very sort of up and down. And um, one minute it feels really, really good bombing along there. And the next thing you know, you can have a dip and what have you. And, I mean, you might be surprised, but I, genuinely, very, very early on in the race, I didn't feel as though it was really happening for me. And I did think maybe it's just not, not going to happen. I, you know, before getting the clay bank thought, I might stop, you know, jack this in. But the climb out of, of Kildale really got me going. That's probably what I needed. I needed, you know, I love climbing, got that. Um, and then, yeah, again, like I said, it's head down. But the steps at the white horse... <laughs> I did if I was absolutely getting up those things, I just thought, oh, I can't do this. And really did just dip, but just managed to get up then. And then I know the last section really, really well and just head down again. But that was a real hard slog to get myself up those steps. Yeah. Kendra, you're smiling there. Was that the same for you? Yeah. I'm sure I was going a lot slower than Ben, but yeah, they're <laughs> just horrible. They're just horrid. <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> It was quite funny because I, I, um, I left that checkpoint and there was a couple of girls behind me and all the way up they were, they were saying, I don't like these steps. These steps aren't much fun. <laughs> you know, and they were, they were chunting away. On, and then as they, once they got to the top, they were away. So uh, they kind of been too bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I think, I think for me, that was when, the, I mean, you guys will probably have it a bit worse than I did, but that's when it just started chucking it down as well, you know, really oh, right. heavily. So it just, just got me for a minute that, yeah. Yeah. Wasn't much fun. <laughs> yeah, I think that downpour, it was just before Lord's Cafe that w w it hit, hit, hit me. And um, for about 40 minutes, it was torrential, wasn't it? You were absolutely soaked. Uh, yeah. yeah. So what point were you at, Kendra, when it started raining? You must have been a little bit further ahead. Yeah, I wasn't that much further ahead. Um, but uh, I put full kit at that point because I was expecting it to last about an hour, so... I fully kitted up with waterproof trousers and, you know, I made sure I was warm. And then once the hour had passed, I just stripped off again. And um, I really looked after myself on this event, which I also think added to the overall experience. Yeah. Obviously, Ben, you'd have been running so quick, you wouldn't have felt the rain, I imagine. <laughs> I, I am extremely vulnerable and soft when it comes to inclement weather, I'm afraid. But yeah, I, I think I made a really sensible decision at Square Corner. It was still dry when I got to Square Corner, started climbing up to... Black Hamilton, and I just I stopped then and put my rain jacket on then and kept it on from from there. And I think that was a really sensible option because it did come down really heavily after that. Yeah, you know what? I'm sitting there thinking, um, you know, I, I, that was my 50 second ultra that I've done in the last uh, 12 years, but I made a really bad decision uh, out of Osmo when I, when I left Osmotherly Corner Square Corner. I caught up with my friends Andy and Sarah who I'd been running with and started with, and they just stopped to put some warm clothes on. And could I just caught them? I thought, well, no, I'll, I'll stay with them. And for that next 40 minutes, I got colder and colder and colder. And I eventually stopped, you know, just when you go through the gate into the, into the woods. 
and I eventually stopped there and, and put a, a warm layer yeah. on, but it was too late. It took me a while mm. to get going. So it just shows you, you know, here's you guys in your first year or so making all the right decisions. <laughs> and, <laughs> so uh, no, well made, made a lot of mistakes in the past though. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to finish with maybe just um, a, a tip from each of you, maybe Ben, someone who is in a similar situation to you, who is just moving into ultras. Uh, what advice would you give to someone at the speedy end? Maybe someone who's, who's done fast marathons, but thinking about doing a longer race. It's sorry. Two things I'll say, sorry, that's all right. One is, is train on the hills, run hills. It really is really important. That is as many hills as you can get. You can have all the speed in the world, but, hill training really does count and then second as I said it, it, it's taken me a long long time to figure this out the right nutrition when you're racing mm. and eating and, and drinking at the right times makes a huge huge difference yeah okay hills that that would be a good title for a podcast wouldn't it run to the hills run to the hills there yeah. you go yeah <laughs> yeah and maybe for Kendra you could maybe share uh, your thoughts on, on on moving into ultras again because uh, this year is your first year but you've you've tackled a lot you know doing the doing the um, the slam and the, uh, because they're all grouped together and uh, so what advice would you give to someone who was um, was having a midlife crisis um, well, just what Ben was saying about eating um, I struggle on these events I just can't eat at all. Um, but I would say just do it and just like you said, aim to finish well. Keep your heart rate low and just aim to finish well and enjoy it. Um, just take the foot off the gas and just yeah. look around. That's what I would say. Yeah, that's great. Because I remember you were saying, Kendra, in the 60 um, that you felt you maybe went off a little too fast, didn't you? And, and struggled a bit. I struggled all day. Oh, did you? <laughs> I struggled for 60 miles. Six, however long it was, 63 miles. I don't know if that was the heat running too fast. And I finished that 60 and I thought I was going to go in an ambulance because I thought I was dying. <laughs> I, I was just being dramatic, but um, it was awful. And I thought, wow, what, what have I let myself in for here? But I know it was just, I was just trying to race it. I don't know why. I was running too fast. Um, and so I learned a lot, but I think you've got to do these things. You've got to make mistakes to yeah. get better and learn. And the way I felt on the 55, I know that that's what I need to do going forward for the AC. So uh, I'm really excited now about the AC. Yeah. I just want to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's my, my last question for each of you. Have you got other races that you've got planned this year or any big races for next year? Uh, for me, like I said, it's been a funny old year, so nothing this year but Hardmore's 30, New Year's Day, and then back for the Lakeland 50, which was cancelled this year in, in July, so there'd, there'd be maybe one more, maybe the 55 again, if I can get in. And for you, Kendra, what's your big challenge for next year? Um, well, I've entered the flare, uh, which is in June, the spine flare. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Um, but I really want to do the super slam again. So, but I think the 110 would be two weeks before the flare. So I, I don't, I don't think I'm good enough to be doing that, but we'll see. <laughs> the, uh, I'll, I'll probably just enter. Yeah. <laughs> think yeah. about it later. <laughs> Well, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on tonight and congratulations on a great performance from the pair of you. And uh, we wish you all the best for next year and whatever, whatever you have planned. So thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. So I hope you've enjoyed that uh, feel of the, the Hardmost 55. And if those who are listening to this who did the race, thank you so much. And we hope you, in, you enjoyed uh, your race as well. I've seen a number of posts and some uh, reports and videos of people who took part. So it's lovely to see those as well. So Eddie, what have you got planned this weekend, this coming week? I know one kilometer, oh. one kilometer loops, <laughs> yeah. John. Variations on one kilometer. I feel like I'd write a song about it. <laughs> uh, I've got my oldest has been away skiing on a glacier. It's all right for some 10 year olds, isn't it? So he's, we're really looking forward to it. He's coming back this weekend. And so we're having a little Halloween. I don't really like Halloween, but um, 
we're having a little Halloween party this weekend. So I feel it's really important. And conf- we have, you have to sort of have things to look forward to, don't you, when you're in lockdown? Otherwise, it's just day in, day out. So we'll make a weekend. And then, yeah, I'm going to start my new training block. I um, haven't really worked out how I'm going to do that. But I'll try and get into, I like to do the same things on the day. So Monday will be something, Tuesday, and I'll repeat that. And I'm going to write my six-week training block this weekend so I can bore everybody with that next weekend so i'll have a relatively quiet weekend um and then yes yeah, start my alpine training block this week which i'll share with you next week what that's going to look like and just keep running my keep running my loops and looking up at the mountains and keep trying to smile and be brave like my mantra what about you john <laughs> a little, little bit of jogging yeah this weekend i was going to go for a run tomorrow with katrina up on the braes and then um, see how it goes uh, next week uh, I just want to mention as well that um, we're doing our countdown to the spine with Stephen Brown and we've got the second episode on Sunday so that will be 10 weeks to go and then Stephen's going to share his thoughts about sleep strategy and I know that's a big thing for him mm. on the mm. on the spine he would say himself that he's not one of the faster runners but he is very very good at managing his sleep so that should be a really interesting episode where Stephen's going to share some of his tips about how to manage um, sleep on the spine. I'm John Kiniston. This was episode 12. I'm Eddie Sutton, and let's run to the hills.